I uh, just want to mention uh, something to you that Wyatt does. I know he mentions it a couple of times during some of his classes, but he does do online coaching. And so if you're interested in um, getting some help, I know some guys here actually at the seminar uh, work with Wyatt. He goes online, does some coaching and training, creates yep, creates some private. Uh, how, do you enjoy it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not only that, my IR rating almost doubled. Oh, that's cool. His I rating doubled. Went from a 10 to a 20. So like I said, 18, something like that. That's, cool. that's very, very good. Well, uh, his information, his contact information is on the sheet. Uh, just want to make sure you do that. Also, um, uh, just want to say again, we appreciate everybody being here and hope you, hope you guys are having some fun. Uh, lots of tournament racing tonight, so uh, it's going to be good. So I'm just going to turn this thing over to Wyatt. Take it away. Hey, hello. Hey. All right, how are you guys doing this morning? Cool, cool. Okay, so um, now yesterday I started uh, in the second session. I was I was talking about setups, kind of getting into setup. Uh, that was kind of not as detailed as as this is going to be. I'm going to try to actually do some some more on track demonstration of what these changes are going to do. Uh, give you guys a better idea of kind of how I would go about feeling the the setup changes. So. I'm going to use the, uh, the Renault at Road Atlanta. And the Formula Renault is a really good car because uh, uh, it's, it reacts really well to setup changes. And it's relatively simple. So it's a good, it's a good starter car to get into if you want to learn setup. Um, you know, not too simple, not too complex. Uh, it's kind of like entry level aero and, and two way adjustable shocks r rather than four way. It's a little bit simpler. Um, and again, the best thing about it is the the way it reacts to, to setup changes. So I will actually, I'll start with the baseline too. Actually, I forgot we got, I think the iRacing setups are pretty good. Okay, so kind of just um, looking back on yesterday's sessions, <coughs> I mentioned uh, the first thing I usually would try to start tweaking and, and seeing what I can get to the optimal is the, the tire pressures. So the tire pressures are gonna make the biggest difference in the beginning, and then once you find that optimal pressure range, um, then you can pretty much work from that from that point forward. So, th so the right now I've loaded the iRacing medium downforce setup, and uh, so cold pressures at 19. Um, you can expect hot pressures to get to about uh, about 24.5. Again, I'm so used to KPA, I need to convert it here. OK, so hot pressures, you want to get around 23, 23.5. So to do that, typically, you starting pressures would be in the 19 to 20 range. Um, depending on the track, I may go up um, 1 to 2 PSI variance from any track. Basically, a track with a lot of low-speed corners, again, I'm going to go lower with the cold pressure. And starting pressure might go as low as 18, 18.5. Um, but again, that's going to give me better traction in the really tight corners. So to try, like a street circuit like Long Beach, for instance, I would want to run really low PSI and get really good traction in the low speed corners uh, and a good, a good bite off those slow corners. Uh, to track like Brands Hatch or even here, because you got a lot of fast corners at Road Atlanta, I might go all the way up to 21, for instance. Uh, or maybe even higher than that. You just you want to test it and you want to try it and see what works for you. So when you're playing around with the tire pressures, and you know, try this when you get to your rig. Um, you know, just test these big kind of differences and, and setup changes. And like I said, with this car, it's really good to learn because you can really feel these changes. Because the car gives you really good feedback. 
So I'm just going to change the field of view here. This is what I run on triples, and I'm about 25 inches from the screen. I run about 130. So it's a little bit closer to you. Yeah, you can't see as much on the side, but it's just more of an accurate field of view. So Roading Land, again, a great uh, test track, like I mentioned yesterday. You got, <coughs> you got corners where you can really test the shocks over the uh, curb strikes. And you got low speed stuff, you got high speed stuff, you can feel the aero changes or some mechanical grip changes. So a really good test track all around. So right now I'm running 22 PSI, intentionally gone a little bit higher in the tire pressure. Um, and what I'm already starting to notice is in the slow speed corner, like the one I just went out of, the slowest corner on the track, it's turn seven. Uh, the car is a little bit skatey. It's not, uh, it's not really getting good bite. Uh, the tire kind of feels um, a little bit floaty in the low speed. I'm gonna get used to this brake pedal. But in these faster corners, it feels really good. The car's really responsive in the faster corners with the higher pressure. So turn one was really solid through there. And we're getting into the lower speed stuff. So the tire feels a bit nervous in these slower corners. So again, you know, with setup, you got to remember that everything is a compromise. Um, I mean, there's no perfect setting. That's why people can run different settings and uh, running the same lap time, but the way they're getting to that lap time, you know, you might be faster in different parts of the track with different setups. It's always a compromise, which is why there's no right or wrong. So I'm going to go ahead and lower the, uh, the tire pressure. So 20.5 for me, personally, it's a good balance. Um, I can get through the fast corners real good. The car's real responsive. The tire just feels really responsive. It gives me good feedback. Um, and at the same time, I'm not quite as uh, slow in the low speed corners. So I still get pretty good traction in the low speed corners. So I'm gonna try that for lap. And uh, this car is just going to be a, a little slippery in the first lap, especially in colder weather sessions. If, you've got, if you guys have done races in dynamic weather, you notice in this car in cold weather, it's really tough. Um, one thing that I would recommend doing in a, a session that might, you know, you join a ra race session and the weather happens to be maybe a lot colder than what you practice in, uh, try going up a half PSI or one PSI on tire pressure. It really makes a big difference in the first lap. Just uh, that half a pound difference to a pound will, will give you a lot more stability, a lot more uh, comfort on that first lap. And it shouldn't affect the car through the rest of the race too much. I'm getting a little bit better traction like out of the chicane, out of that last uh, Hairpin turn seven, so I, I like this tire pressure. This is what I'm going to stick with here. So again, when you're getting into a new car and you, you're finding the, the optimal tire pressure, you're going to have to run a bunch of laps. I mean, there's no really quicker way to do it. You, you probably want to do about four or five lap stints because that's where the you know, tires are going to get to their optimal pressure. And uh, generally, I would just go by I'm usually looking at my delta uh, when I'm doing tire pressure changes because you can see where you're picking up time. It's going to be in certain types of corners. You can, you know, again, as you go higher in the pressure, you're going to get faster and, and 
the high speed corners and vice versa. Uh, Manning just asked if I, if I load a comparison lap. Um, usually what I'll do is I'll just go in a default weather session. If I'm really just testing the car, I'll do default weather. I'll just make sure that, you know, I, I don't have that variable. So it's the same weather. If I'm going in a new session, I'll know, like, at least what to kind of shoot for. And I'll just do session, usually session optimal. I don't really do all time optimal anymore because, you know, you go in different weather sessions and then that gets changed. So. Okay, so tire pressure at 20.5. And we'll get into um, aero with this car as well. This car is actually pretty sensitive to aero changes. And uh, it's not like the Star Mazda was, at least last season, where uh, the Star Mazda, you pretty much just run near max in the front and fully trimmed out in the rear. Uh, this car, really particular to uh, the track you're running, what downforce settings you want to run. And also, the front downforce percentage. This is something you guys want to start to pay attention to. It's real important. It's really good to have this, too. Um, it makes it a lot easier to, to kind of get an idea of roughly where your downforce level is going to be when you want to add more downforce. Because, uh, you know, proportionally front to rear, this keeps it uh, kind of level, so you know where you're at. So you see, you, with the default uh, medium downforce setup, we're at 38.2 which is pretty low front downforce. It's not too far off. So you figure the balance of uh, you know, where the car is producing downforce front to rear. Um, I like to run it at about 41, 42. Now, when I, go higher, when I go higher in the wing angle, or overall downforce, um, front downforce is going to be right around 41 or so. This is about right. But now, say I wanna, I'm at a track that uh, I end up going faster with the wings a little bit trimmed out. Say I'd say medium downforce would be about maybe 27 and 10. So you can see as you go lower on the overall downforce, roughly the same front downforce is what you want to aim for you know, as you're going lower. So you want to change those settings. Um, as you're lowering those settings, you want to make sure you're matching up that front downforce percentage. That's really important. That'll save you a lot of time trying to figure out, <clears throat> you know, how to go lower or high, higher on the downforce <coughs> and uh, keep that same front downforce percentage. And again, this is a really good thing to test just by itself. Just, you know, see how the car feels with uh, a lot of downforce and see, okay, we'll try a really high front downforce percentage. So we trim the rear wing out a little bit and we're running max front wing, so the car's gonna be, we would expect the car to be pretty oversteery. And, uh, we, you know, with arrow changes, obviously the faster corner you're going through, uh, the more pronounced that arrow balance is gonna become. So it's good to, it's good to test that and try it, because then you start to feel the difference between an arrow change and, say, a mechanical grip change. So the car is like much more nervous now and it really, the front end just wants to point, uh, it's much harder to drive. And some people like to drive the car really loose. But it's too unstable for me. Especially off the corner. So you see the car just kind of keeps wanting to turn, you have much more front wing on it. And again, turn one here is really good, a really good place to test the aero balance, get a good idea of what you got. <clears throat> so corner entry actually isn't too bad, but that's because my brake bias is too far forward. And then when I get off the brakes and I'm just about at apex, that's when the car continues to want to turn. And that's all arrow. See, at high speed, it's where it's a little bit more sketchy. Now, finding the optimal downforce settings for every track is, um, it's not really cut and dry. You just got to test. 
you got to run laps. And what I would recommend doing um, is just simply running. Once you get the track down, you know, then that's when you want to start getting into this stuff, not until you're consistent. But um, once you get the track down, just go down and downforce in increments of maybe uh, five degrees on the wing or something. So for instance, and we start, say we start at high downforce, so we got the downforce maxed out, which is a good way to start testing, you know, get fast on max downforce, and start trimming out the wing. And uh, that way, once you're quick with the track, you, you know, you'll figure out quickly where your, uh, you know, your overall gain, is it going to be greater or less? Because obviously with less wing, uh, you're not going to have as much grip in the high-speed corners, and um, you're going to be faster on the straights. So it's always a compromise. So at Road Atlanta, I found that running about in the range of 25, 9, 26, 10 is pretty good. Um, I think I ran a league race here, the, the 2K Cup, and I ran uh, 27, 10, and that worked out pretty well. But I was just as fast with 25 and 8, I think. But 27, 10 just gave me a little bit more uh, stability, so I stuck with that. And again, when you're running lower downforce, uh, sometimes it takes a, more than five laps to adjust to it because um, you're so used to running with the high wing, you can push harder in the, in the high speed corners. It gives you more confidence. To make the lower downforce work, you've got you've to really adapt to the car just having less overall downforce. So that's something to consider too. Before you just go and try lower downforce and you're immediately slower, you might just not be uh, pushing the car as hard as you, you could. So again, that just takes laps to test uh, and get up to speed with that. Now, one thing that I noticed when I was driving was the, uh, the brake bias was kind of preventing me from trail braking very easily. So and we've got the, the def it defaults to 56.5. Um, what I'm pretty much running at every track is around 55.1, 54.8 maybe. I think at, at Donington, 55.1, Road Atlanta, 55.1. So I'm going to stick with that. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, the, the brake bias, one of the easiest things to, to adjust. You just got to take into account specifically how it's affecting the handling of the car. Again, it's, the brake bias is only affecting the, the balance of the car on braking and turn-in before weight transfer, before the suspension settings are really taking effect. So for instance, when I was running, um, just earlier when I was trying lower rear downforce, I noticed that when I would turn in, the car still had understeer, even though I uh, lowered the rear wing a lot. And that was because that brake bias was uh, more towards the front, a little bit too much front bias. And then once I got off the brakes, then I could really feel that arrow oversteer. And then just start to think about where you're feeling these changes, specifically what part of the corner, that's really important. Uh, again, just building that awareness to, to uh, those setup changes and start to kind of pinpoint exactly what you want to change. So again, the only thing I've changed now is brake bias and uh, already I'm able to trail into the corner a little bit better without the fronts wanting to lock so easily. Still a little bit loose on entry. We'll try this 27-10 uh, arrow balance here and see how it is in turn one. The brake bias is much better, so I'm able to trail brake into the corner and just kind of make it more of a constant arc from turn into apex. It's more consistent, it's more predictable for me, so it's easier for me to drive that way. But too much forward bias. When you get on the brakes, you get understeer too quickly. And it's real hard to keep that arc through the corner, which is real important. Okay, so um, back to the changes here. Now, uh, toe in, uh, toe in in the front and the rear, we'll start with the front toe. It's a pretty noticeable change, and again, that's uh, really just assisting with your initial turn in. So that's the way I like to uh, kind of look at toe, is if I need just a little bit more of a kick on turning, a little bit more rotation. As soon as I start to turn the wheel, I'll uh, bump up the toe a little bit. So we'll try, we'll try a bit of a drastic change, exaggerated change, to really see the effect here. 
Now, typically, I wouldn't really run, I wouldn't need to run more than uh, a 16th or minus 2 30 seconds. And again, you always want to run negative toe in in the front and positive toe in in the rear. So it's kind of confusing, but it's like toe in is negative, or I'm sorry, toe out is negative toe in. So two negatives make a positive. That's just the way I, I racing words it. Some other sims will probably call it toe, and it might be the other way around. But in this case, negative toe in is toe out, which you want in the front, and you want positive toe in in the rear. And in general, with most, most cars, I'll, I'll try to run the toe close to neutral and set up the car to do what I want in other ways. And I'll use the toe kind of only if I need that last little bit of a kick, last little bit of rotation on turning. <clears throat> so now you can see how the toe is actually affecting the car, specifically in corner entry. I mean, as soon as I start to turn the wheel, the car kind of points where I'm turning really quickly. And that's going to affect the balance of the car when it does get into the weight transfer period through the corner. Right on turning, the car is really dirty. Now, the disadvantage just to running that much toe is uh, you're going to lose a bit of straight line speed. And uh, you're going to get a bit more tire wear. But I, I don't think in this car tire wear is really a factor ever. I've only done 45 minute races. I didn't have a problem with tires at the end, so you don't really have to worry too much about that. It's more so just straight line speed, so I try to use as little toe as possible just to keep up higher straight line speed. <clears throat> okay, before we move on into the uh, suspension settings, does anyone have any questions? Do we have a microphone? Oh, that's all right. I'll just repeat the question. All right. Um, is the optimum tire pressure, uh, is it stayed the same kind of from car to car with minimal variance based off the sim? You know, or, or what, what is the optimum tire pressure, I guess, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, it, it really depends on the tire. And, and his question was, uh, what is the optimal tire pressure and does it differ from car to car? Um, it depends on the tire. Like every tire is different. Even in, in iRacing, they model different manufacturers of tires. You know, like the Renault tire is a Michelin slick and the GT3 tires are now Pirelli. So every tire is different. And usually every manufacturer will have a recommended range for tire pressure. Um, but a lot of the times teams don't even follow that recommendation. Sometimes the optimal will be under or over that. They'll find so that um, even the teams have to just go out and test and figure it out and, okay, this works, so we'll stick with this, you know. That's why, I mean, the, you know, the, the top teams in real racing, even the teams that can afford to test the most are going to have the biggest advantage because they're going to figure all this stuff out. But um, as far as car to car, um, it really depends. Like, um, like I said, GT3s are 180, 190. Um, this car is 150, 160 range. It seems to work pretty good. Um, I think the Star Mazda is pretty close to that, maybe a little bit lower. Um, anyone know if the Skip Barber is lower than that optimal tire pressure range? I think it is. Because you run the starting pressures on the Skippy pretty low. So it really just depends on the car and, and you know, what gives you the best lap time at the end of the day. Anyone else have questions on tire pressure, toe, and... Uh, Go back to the arrow setup screen. It, the the values on there that for right had its speed, there, there seems to be a lot of, that does nothing, right? That's the information yeah. only, is that the way I understand it? If you change those arrows, nothing changes, right? What's really confusing about it, that was a good question. What's confusing about it is um, if you change this, then your front downforce numbers change. So, and I should have pointed that out. Thanks for mentioning that. I leave this at the default. I don't, I don't change that from default, just so I have a, a frame of reference for this, a constant for this. Because when you start changing the front ride height at speed, um, it'll change that. Now, what you could do is you could just put the um, front ride height to what you have it set at, but then that's going to change your front downforce number. 
So just for simplicity's sake, I would say don't change that from default. And then you can just go by your front down force from that. Because some people will say, maybe have this different, and then their front down force, they'll say something, some completely different number, and yeah, it's very confusing. OK, any other questions? Aero, tire pressures? OK. All right, so anti-roll bar in this car, you only have an anti-roll bar in the rear. Uh, it's, a very, it's very useful. The car, you can, you can really feel the difference with each click. Now, um, the ARB here, you see it, see at the bottom. OK, we have the rear pretty stiff. So the softer you go in the rear ARB, um, the more kind of unresponsive the rear end is going to be throughout the corner. And this is going to be noticed in every corner. It's going to give you much better traction out of especially low speed corners at the expense of understeer. So I'm going I'm to go ahead and take the ARB off completely, which I haven't actually done on a setup yet, but um, it's going to give the car, it's going to make the rear end a lot more planted. And this is something you want to try too, because it's, like I said, the ARB adjustments are really uh, very reactive. Now what I would recommend for uh, inner roll bar in this car is running as close to the softest setting as you can, or, or as you prefer to, um, to the point where you can at least get the car to turn. That way you're going to get stability with the softer anti roll bar. I mean, it almost feels like I have traction control on this car now with the anti roll bar off. When I'm going through a corner and I get on throttle now, there's just no, no um, warning in the steering wheel that I'm going to get oversteer. So really, it gives me a lot of confidence on exit. It's much better. Even out of seven there, you can tell especially. Low speed traction is, is why, uh, the benefits in low speed traction is why you want to run the rear end and roll bar pretty low. So I'd say in this car, I probably won't be ever running uh, more than, I guess, the middle setting. So lots more traction coming up. And the car still turns good. So you can see running lower ARB is a, a really big benefit in this car. It really helps. It's much, much less nervous. The car is much more stable, so I think we'll, uh, we'll stick with the lower setting. Now again, I have it disconnected, which uh, it's also something you can try, but I, I usually keep mine around the I think the second to lowest, so the closest to being disconnected seems to be best for me. So that's good traction, and that just makes the car easier to drive. Why is that an in-car adjustment on this one, or no? No. Yeah, the only... Then I was asked if that was an in-car adjustment, and no, it isn't. The only... Um, the only thing you can adjust in car is brake bias. And um, brings up another point too. Some people adjust their brake bias like throughout the lap, but uh, I, I don't do that. It's not really necessary. Maybe in the Formula One car, but um, you really won't have to do that. Sometimes it's, it's nice to uh, keep the brake bias a little bit forward for high speed corners. And then say you have a low speed section like the last sector at Donington, you can run like lower, uh, you know, you can go like a click or two to the rear and then you get a little bit better turning into those really tight hairpins, which, you know, you get a lot of understeer in this car. And that's another thing with this car is that, uh, and this goes for all cars, all cars are going to have some inherent fundamental balance, you know, whether they're rear engine or front, front engine. Rear engine cars are going to be more understeer and turn in, always. And um, they're going to have good traction off the corner. So this rear engine formula car is going to be a little bit harder to get to turn in. You've got to be patient with the car on, on entry. Um, and if you try to completely dial that out, then what happens is that now the balance through the rest of the corner is going to be completely off. So you've got to just kind of you know, use that and work from it, that little bit of understeer. So the brake bias, you know, some people want to adjust the brake bias in the middle of a lap, but I, I don't. Because if I try doing that, I'll usually end up going slower because I'm... <laughs> 
Yeah, right, I'm trying to click buttons while I drive, which I don't like doing. So overall, not really something you need to worry about. OK, now springs on this car um, really can pretty much run. I mean, you, you, you want to experiment with different spring rates. Um, what I found, I liked uh, having the rear as soft as I can go. And um, I like the front to be at the stiffest, so 900 in the front, 800, 800 in the rear. That's what I started running at Road Atlanta. Uh, before that, I was running 700 in the front, 800 in the rear, uh, which felt good. The front end with the softer spring rate is going to feel a little bit, uh, it's going to feel a little bit sluggish. And um, it's going to kind of carry into the corner a little bit easier when you turn in. And it's going to want to kind of continue to carry the car through the corner. Now, when I ran it stiffer in the front, the front end becomes a little bit more responsive. But um, it's also, it, it gives you a bit more stability. And then I would adjust my arrow around that. So with the f stiffer front spring rate, you're going to be fighting a little bit more understeer. But that's, you know, that's something you want to compensate with maybe running a little bit more front downforce, which is why I started running the front downforce at 41% roughly. Again, with those default settings, it's very important. And um, when I would run 700 in the front, 800 in the rear, I had the front downforce at probably around 40.5. So that was how I was compensating that. And um, that feeling for me just gave me a bit more stability and with the same amount of rotation through the corner. So it's all a compromise. And the spring adjustments are really uh, pretty locked down. I mean, you can only go up in the rear 800 to 1,000, front 700 to 900. So there really is no optimal setting. I was running pretty similar lap times. Yeah, the same lap times with 700 front, 800 rear. But um, I found that the car was, uh, it was just, it gave me a bit more stability with 900 in the front, 800 in the rear. Same lap times. And I like the responsiveness on the front end. And I just, I, I prefer a stiffer front end, even in real uh, formula stuff. OK, now the diff preload is a, a really, um, it's a really important setting, uh, specifically to get the car to rotate on turn in and to have better, um, to have a little bit more stability on corner exit. So the lower you go with the diff preload, um, the more oversteer you're going to have off throttle. Um, and then the higher you go with the diff preload, the more rear locking you have off throttle. And then that's going to create understeer off throttle. Um, and this is, this is kind of a driving style dependent setting, because some people will run it at 30, some people like 20. Personally, I run it at 0. Um, I run it at 0 at most tracks. Because I like to get the car to turn early on the brakes, and then I want to have good traction when I get to power. And I'll set up the car around that. So running it at zero is a big difference uh, off throttle. And again, this is a setting that's going to affect the car, regardless of how you're loading the car through the corner, because it's not a weight transfer. Setting change like the suspension and anti-roll bar settings are. Watch the balance of the car and turn in. You see, when I, right when I get off throttle and turn in, the car will just kind of do like point to where I want it to go pretty easily. And then I can just wait for it to rotate. And then when I get to throttle, I know I'm going to have a little bit more stability. And uh, that's kind of my preferred driving technique. I like the car to get, to, I like to get the car to rotate early, get to that apex early, and be you know have a better trajectory by the time I get to the apex that way, and have good traction. Uh, when I get in throttle. So now when I just get off the throttle and I'm turning, um, the car will, the front end will just point a lot easier. And 
then I can get to throttle earlier and kind of balance that uh, rotation. But that's diff preload. It's a really useful change. So definitely try out those different settings and see what works best for you. And why do you do you target um, you know kind of the a neutral balance point yourself on diff preload for that and you know. It all, does not, you know, lower, running lower diff also give you a little bit more rotation in the car, stable rotation in the car mid corner as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a balance of, you know, off throttle, braking, turn in, and you, you're wanting to maintain a constant arc through the corner. You know, it need it wants to be really constant. That's always going to be the fastest way to take a corner. So you want the balance of the car to be constant from entry to mid, mid to exit, and. Um, for me, when I get that early rotation, I can balance it really well because I trail brake a lot. Braking precision, that's something I'm better at. So, um, so I, I got to take advantage of that by getting the car to rotate good on the brakes. And then when I get off the corner on, on power, it's continuing that rotation. And I'm balancing it with a little bit of throttle early, past apex. So the diff preload, uh, were you asking if it's a setting that will affect mid-corner? found it gives the car a little bit more rotation. rotation, stable rotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then going too low on it isn't good because then when you get off throttle, sometimes it'll be too snappy. So you got to balance that too. It's just, you know, you got to find the right amount of rotation off throttle and turn in that works for you. Like for instance, in GT3s, um, the BMW, I like it at around 30, 25, depending on the track, depending on the type of corners. Sometimes at, like at Monza, we would go a little bit lower so you can get that quick flick into turn one, you know? And, um, and then, you know, say at a track like <clears throat> Brands Hatch with a lot of fast corners, I don't want that quick flick, you know, that quick off throttle rotation. So I'll kind of maybe go up one or two clicks on the preload. And then plus Brands Hatch, you need to get that rotation a little bit more through the corner because you got longer corners. So, you know, you're in throttle sooner and you need the car to continue to rotate for a little bit longer through those really long corners. So anyone else got? Uh, Mike? Uh, Mike. Mission. Should have mentioned it's water go. Doesn't the ARB have a preload too on this car? Oh, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, just keep it at zero. As long as, uh, as long as your setup is symmetrical, it should be at zero. Yeah, just make sure it's at zero. And John's got a question here. Uh, don't you have to set the ramp angles first before you adjust the the preload, the setting below that? Well, this car only ha this car only has diff preload. This one here. Go down to the diff ramp angles. Oh, this one. <laughs> That's funny. I couldn't see that, so I <laughs> forgot about it. Um, yeah, this one too. Um, They're yeah, kind of opposite. It, yeah, and you want to set this also first. I mean, this is something that I don't even change at all because I just leave it. I like 65, 70. Let me explain that. Thank you for reminding that because I didn't even see it. Um, 65 coast, 70 drive. It's just a little bit less locking on coasting and more locking on drive. And I prefer that because, again, it's just a little bit more rotation off throttle and then more rotation on throttle, or less rotation on throttle, sorry. And then 70. So you just got two settings for that. So 70 coast and 65 drive is more locking uh, on coast, so more understeer, off throttle, and then a little bit more rotation when you get back in the gas. So yeah, you're right. That's a setting that you want to kind of dial in before you even do the preload, because that's just that's something you're going to set it and probably leave it there. I mean, you might change it from track to track. Well, but you're gonna, you, you gotta, wherever that is, then you're going to move the, the preload. Right. The same field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So that is that is definitely what you want to do first, adjust the ramp angles. Um, again, at a track with more longer sweeping corners where I maybe want the car to um, continue to rotate when I get back in the gas a little bit more, I might go with the other uh, ramp angles with more locking off throttle and less locking on throttle. And then maybe add a little bit of diff preload in. But uh, so far, I've only used 65 coast and 70 drive and pretty close to zero preload. So that's something to consider for 
faster tracks with longer corners where you do, you, you know, you, you're on throttle sooner and you're still carrying the throttle through the corner for a little bit longer. Um, in that instance, you might want the car to rotate on, on power a little bit more. Okay, so bump and rebound. So this, uh, this car has a little bit simpler bump and rebound settings. And as far as I understand, it's kind of the, it's gonna affect, uh, it's gonna affect the shocks over curbs um, with the same setting as it's gonna affect the car on weight transfer. But now I've been adjusting these settings mainly for curbs. And uh, what you'll notice is that it will also affect weight transfer too. But you only have two-way adjustable, so it's gonna adjust both. So we'll test these here. We'll just go minimum and maximum just so I can demonstrate what they do over the curves. So getting these sh shock settings right is actually really helpful at a track like here with uh, going over the chicane, the turn three chicane, and uh, the turn five, the turn five uh, left-hander at Road Atlanta, the notorious exit curb that throws your car around. Does anyone else have questions on diff preload ramp angles? You had a question, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wait, Wendy. You're talking, you're, you're talking now. You're ex very experienced road driver, so you do a lot of trail braking, as you were saying. If you're not quite up to the trail braking, would that very much affect how you're going to set the car up? Then, if you're, or would you recommend getting starting learning to trail brake from the, you know, as soon as possible? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, braking into the turn and carrying the brakes into the turn. If you can, you want to set up your rig to be able to do that. You know, you want you want the pedals to be comfortable enough to where you can modulate that little bit of brake on turn in. It's really important uh, because that's how you're going to get that balance that you want in that transition from braking to turn in. Really important, and you're absolutely right. That will affect how you set up the car. That's why um, some people like certain setups and other people can't drive certain setups. You know, because they're not trail braking at all or you know braking too hard on turn in or something so definitely work on the uh, work on modulating that brake pedal on turn in and one thing you can do that's really useful is uh, when you're driving you, know, you got this um, no, I can't show the mouse but you see where my throttle and brake is like just look at your brake input and try to be aware of you know, that little amount of brake input that you're using. Right up on the screen there in the bottom left, you can see it. And then, you know, go back and watch a replay. Because when you're starting to turn in, you want to be on the brake really lightly and starting to ease off the brake into the corner as you continue to steer into the corner. Really light brake release. That's the best thing about getting good pedals because it makes that easier. And you can just control the brake modulation easier. So yeah, that will affect setup. <clears throat> For instance, I, I trail brake, um, I think quite, I think I trail brake more than most people. Um, and that's coming from driving front wheel drive cars where you had to trail brake to get them to turn. And um, that's why I, I like lower preload um, because I, I can take advantage of that early turn in rotation on the trail braking. A lot of people run higher preload though. So it's, you know, there's no right or wrong way. It's just that suits my style. Of driving. Okay, so the gearing in this car is kind of something you don't have to worry too much about. Um, all you, because all you have is a seventh gear, and uh, sometimes you'll run the longer gear. The only tracks that I ran it at so far was Phillip Island, uh, just because you have that really long last corner that you already carry a lot of speed into, and then you go down the straightaway, um, and you would hit about 150, 354. I think the shorter ratio tops out at about 150. Um, and it's funny, we were using the shorter ra ratio at Spa. It was faster. Um, it was faster to use the shorter ratio, even though we were hitting the limiter like three quarters of the way down the straight, because uh, the car doesn't have very much power. So seventh gear through e Rouge, up e Rouge, it just bogs down. So the shorter ratio will work. You got to factor in the acceleration, too, because that longer seventh gear, the car barely has enough power to, to pull um, and give you as much torque. So it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, I typically wouldn't use this just for extra speed in the draft because um, generally you will just be faster overall if you run the shorter and just try to stay ahead of people <laughs> that have the taller gear. 
make it easier to stay ahead of people with the taller gear anyway. Okay, now uh, cambers. On this car, you, it seems like pretty low camber is, is good. I guess this was default, which is actually really close to what I'm running now. Um, again, you want to have a, I usually keep a certain split from front to rear. I like to have 0.5 more in the front. I've just found that to give me the nice crisp turn in and the front tire loads nicely the way I want it to. Um, with uh, again, 0.5 higher in the front and the rear. I've tried going down a couple clicks from this. I've tried going up. Um, it really doesn't seem to affect lap time much, and, um, but it does affect stability under braking. A little bit less camber will make the car uh, less nervous under braking. So if you can get away with less camber, it's generally going to help stabilize the car on braking. So far, I haven't really ventured far from, say, 1.8, 1.2, or uh, 1.5, 1.1, 1.0, for instance. I've tried lower and higher, but it, lap times aren't really affected too much. And uh, within that range, like under two in the front, under one in, or under 1.5 in the rear, generally you'll have um, pretty equal tire temps in the inside. And that's that's what you want to gauge your uh, your cambers by. If you're running too much, if you're running too much camber, um, this inside temperature is going to be a little bit uh, higher. Now, another thing to look at too is tread wear. Tread wear is pretty useful, but then you'd have to run at least maybe five or ten laps to get a good readout on it. And because um, that'll say, like, it'll say 98, 99, 100 or 98, 98, 100. So you'll have a, a good idea of how much of the tread is actually being used over the course of the lap. So that's, that's a good indicator too. I actually use that more so than uh, temps. The, the tread, tread remaining is really useful for just checking the cambers and making sure they're not uh, completely out of whack. And the rest is just up to you to test and, and figure out what works best for you. So again, a little bit less will help with stability under braking. Okay, back to the shocks. Now we've lowered the bump all the way, um, again, to the left. So now that should, what that's going to do is when I go over the curb, that should make the car a little bit more bouncy on compression. Okay, so hopefully this, I can demonstrate this and then you can see it. So again, we've lowered the compression and that's going to make that the car accept that curb uh, much easier. And I've lowered it all the way. So just going over the bump, and this is actually how I test high-speed shocks really quickly. I'll just do outlaps and drive over a curb. Um, going over that bump, the car was, let's see, kind of slow-mo it. So you can see the car kind of start to bounce when I landed. So that, that soft bump actually seemed to accept the curb pretty well, but it was just when the car landed, um, it started bouncing. So let's try running. Now we're going to go in the, re the rebound. And again, the rebound is going to um, bring, that sh bring that tire back down to the ground after that initial curb strike. So if we go right, it's going to bring it down quicker. If we go left, it's going to bring it down slower. So we'll try all the way to the right, just maxing it out. So right now we've got completely softest setting re, uh, bump or slowest and then completely fastest rebound setting. This is actually what I ran at Road Atlanta. So 
So we'll look at the replay here in slow mode. Okay, look at how the um, the car uh, sets on the ground after it hits the curb. It's really connects to the road pretty quickly. So see, there wasn't really a bounce that time. So that's going to give me a little bit more traction uh, and confidence to get back to throttle even sooner. So that really helps at a track like this, when you can just get the power down a little bit sooner. And so that's uh, minimum compression and maximum rebound. I found that to work pretty well. And um, again, that's, that's on a bumpy track with a lot of curbs. It seems to work really well. Now we'll try max bump and see how that affects the car with the curb here. Okay, max bump, max rebound. So in this car, I've, I've really been adjusting the shocks just for curbs um, because getting it to react well over the curbs makes a big difference and being able to get the power down and have stability, which is real important. So max bump actually wasn't too bad, but you can see the car kind of, um, it just appeared more rigid when it went over the curb on the initial curb stripe. So we'll look at that on the replay again, Let's see if we can tell the difference. So you can see the car is kind of rigid even when it landed. Um, and that's maximum bump and rebound. So we'll try maximum bump with minimum rebound. Pretty unstable over the curb, but so you can see once I the car set on the ground after the curb strike, uh, it bounced after it set on the ground. So the car, the tire took the curb, landed, and then after it landed, it bounced back up. So that's that's the rebound doing that. And that actually made the car unstable because I was still turning and then I was bouncing and then I lost traction right here. So it was just, the car wasn't quite set on the, the ground as well as it could be. So that, those shock changes will make a big difference. And play around with those settings and that's how you're going to get uh, be able to feel what, what, what they're doing a little bit better, just testing them. So what I would recommend for Road Atlanta, um, near minimum bump or close to uh, slowest bump and then fastest, stiffest rebound. Seems to be uh, pretty good. Okay, before I move on, real quick, does anyone have questions on shocks? Same principles apply to something like Sebring. Like something here, like your setup here would be oh, yeah. transfer over to Sebring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would definitely run probably, uh, yep, minimum bump, max rebound at Sebring would be best. And it'll depend on the car too. Um, you, like you don't want to go and run minimum bump and max rebound at every, uh, or in every car rather, because every car has different parameters for the shock values and how they work, so that you just have to figure that out by the car. For instance, in the GT1, the Aston, um, for whatever reason, maxing out all the values work the best. With max bump, max compression, the car would accept the curb uh, the best, and then with max rebound, it would set on the ground the quickest. Um, anything less than that, when we try to tweak it within that range, it was just not as good as maxing it out. So, you know, clearly the optimal parameter for, for that would be, uh, you know, outside of the window of what iRacing even allows us to adjust. So in that case, sometimes you could just max out everything and it works the best. So 
So it does depend on the car, and, and that's why it's, it's good to just test the stuff and try it. And in the GT3s, for instance, um, overall shock values usually run pretty close to stiffer settings, um, at least in the BMW. I'm not entirely sure with the Audi um, how it works since the update, but uh, near stiffer shock values overall with a little bit more rebounded bump, at least in high speed, is uh, what's preferable from what we've uh, found through testing. I'm guessing I know the answer, but uh, do you uh, go ahead and do asymmetric setups with the high speeds yourself at all? Um, no, no. It, but like we've tried it at Monza, like to get you know, because when the right side smashes that second apex or that second chicane, but it it just kind of affects the car too much everywhere else, like negatively. So, okay. But yeah, just keep it asymmetric or keep it symmetric. Keep it simple. Now, ride height in this car. Uh, you want to you want to try to run as close to as low as you can in the front. That's generally what I've been doing at every track. Tracks with really high curbs are an exception, like Road Atlanta. Um, the split I like. Uh, I like to. I've figured that like 0.6 of an inch front to rear seems to work pretty well. That gives me like um, pretty consistent balance on turn in. It's not too like. It's not too quick and it's not too slow. The turn in, it's nice and subtle. So um, if I'm at 0.6 in the front, I'd be at 1.2 in the rear. And if I go to 0.7 or 0.8 in the front, I would go up to uh, 1.3, maybe 1.35 in the rear. So Road Atlanta was the one track where I've actually, I did raise the front ride height up a little bit and it made the car much easier to, to manage over the, uh, the, the two curbs turn three and turn five, because what would happen with the front at the lowest when I go over the turn five exit curb, the car would kind of skate and wander, um, and the, the front was just hitting the ground. So it made it pretty unpredictable. So if you're having tr uh, trouble with a car over bumps and curbs and high curbs, um, you know, not only look into the bump and rebound, but also raise that front ride height up a little bit. Um, 0.2 inches makes a big difference. So. Make sure to make sure to give that a try. Let's see if we can tell a difference here with minimum front ride height. Right here is where I noticed the minimum front, and uh, the car is just a little bit more nervous. Um, and if you're turning just slightly in that turn five uh, exit curb, then you're very likely to spin. So I mean, I could still run fast with it, but uh, it's just a little bit more sketchy. So right there, you, you know, that's basically you'd, you'd want to just raise the front ride height up to just give you a little bit more stability and make it easier to finish the race. And um, you're not really going to lose much lap time at all, if at all. So when I would raise the front ride up, height up, I would raise the rear as well, just to keep that same um, amount of rake. Physics-wise, you think you're getting off of the ball stops? Uh, I, I don't know, probably. <laughs>
Okay, so we've just adjusted the front ride height, just raised it up 0.2 inches. Car feels really good in the, the turn three chicane now. So that's real important. You want to finish the race first and foremost, and again, just make the car easier to drive. That's always the goal with the setup. But the car didn't quite feel so skatey coming out of five. This gave me a little bit more confidence to get back to power. Now coming off the corner, it's much easier to get to throttle early and the car keeps rotating, but I've got that rear end much more planted. This this uh, last chicane here, 10 A and B, is real tricky for downshifting. Because we've just got so many gears to go down. And then you gotta wait, because you got the uh, rev limiter in this car. So you gotta be patient with your downshift, but you also gotta be quick, so you don't wanna be downshifting too late in the turn. So much more stability now since when we started with the baseline. I'm pretty happy with the way the car feels now. Okay, really fun car to drive. We've been tuning strictly to, um, to the car speed, to, to hot lap speed. Do you, when you set these up, do you give any consideration to being especially um, efficient in overtaking points or, or, for that matter, defensive points? Yeah. Um, you mean like with um, like downforce settings, maybe going a little bit lower? Coming off the hairpin for the straight. Mm -hmm. I would want to be especially fast. Though. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something... Um, Road Atlanta is a track where you can you can make compromises. You can be fast in one part of it and not as fast in another part, uh, and that's a good example. Um, for instance, you could have the rear ARB a little bit softer and just get better traction out of that low speed corner, so you can get a better run on most people down the straight. But uh, then you might not have as good uh, rotation through the high speed stuff. So yeah, that's something to think about too. But generally, I will just set up the car to make it as fast as I can overall and uh, just give me a good balance of low speed traction and high speed rotation. Um, and then with downforce, I sometimes will go a click or two lower in a race if I think that uh, it's gonna be really hard to pass, for instance. A track like Road Atlanta, it's more important to get a good run off seven than it is to trim out your wing. Because if you can get that run, you can suck up in the guy's draft in front of you and be able to pa pass him into that 10 age chicane, so. Um, but yeah, generally I'll just set up the car to try to make it as fast as I can and easy to drive so I can be consistent, so. That 0 0.6 um, ride height split that you used, is that common for all cars or just this one pretty much? Yeah, just this car. Every single car has a different um, ride height or different rake that works best, it seems. And figuring that out, um, it's just when you have too much rake, you can just kind of feel the rear end is a little bit, it almost feels like too top heavy. It's like the car just wants to continue to rotate past turn in, you know, from initial turn in all the way through the corner. And it's like more twitchy. So, and then too low of a ride height, the car, the rear end is just feels like it's not really um, doing much of anything. Uh, but yeah, so, so optimal rake does vary by, completely by the car. Why? Coming, I don't know if anybody's asked this or not yet, but coming from a total oval background, I'm curious. Will you, the way we have to set our cars up has a lot to do with the racetrack itself. Will you cheat a symmetrical setup in any way, depending on 10 right-hand turns compared to five left-hand turns, or whether you have three high-speed rights to very low Low speed lefts, will you cheat a setup one way or the other on a symmetrical setup for that? Yeah, that's funny you ask, because uh, in the GT3 series, that's like an advantage that I had when we went to Lime Rock. 
because I feel like I was the only person that was running an asymmetric setup. So I would run like uh, not really positive camber, but less camber on the right side and more on the left. And that would help in a track like Lime Rock, where you have really, what, one left-hander and all the rest are rights. You can get away with that. But it's really hard to get away with asymmetric otherwise. So it's, it's, even if it's, like you said, if it's five rights, 10 lefts, that's too many rights for it to be asymmetric, you know, because you just lose too much time otherwise. So pretty much Lime Rock is the only uh, one you can get away with that. And now I just let out my secret as to why I was fast there in Star Mazda. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, all right. Oh, well. Secret's out. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much the only track you can probably get away with that. So. so along that line, do you adjust your tire pressure half a pound for the front left, back left? Um, yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll do asymmetric tire pressures, but that's just to get even tire pressures after five laps, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think at Lime Rock I did do more pressure on the lefts and the rights, I'm pretty sure, from what I remember. It was a long time ago. What, when you um, take a car that you already know to a track that you haven't run on or vice versa, do you have a list of things, just like how, how you explained in this class, do you start with your tires first, and then you move to your aero, and then you move to your mechanical? Mm -hmm. Is there a certain priority list that you just go down and, and test like that? Uh, and do you do that for every track, or is it different per car, per track? Well, I'll, I'll go and run through all that stuff if I'm, like, brand new to the car. Because right. once I, I know that stuff, it's, I got a real good baseline, and there, there's not much to change after, after that point. Because you know, you know what optimal tire pressure you want to get to, you know what range is likely going to get you there. Um, but for learning the car, I, I go with just knocking out the biggest changes first, the, the stuff that affects the car the most, so like tire pressures, you want to get that out of the way first. Um, aero is real big. And then I'll get into suspension, figuring out the optimal ride height. And I'm testing all that stuff like one by one. <clears throat> Just to eliminate, you know, variables. You you can't really rush through it. You know, you got to really. If you want to really figure out what does what, you got to do it individually. But um, yeah, tires, aero, um, rake's pretty important. Ride height's pretty important, and then uh, uh, the suspension settings, and then dampers and shocks and dampers are gonna be last, because that's you know, dampers are really fine tuning adjustment. So you want to get the weight transfer stuff out of the way first. Uh, we got time for one more question. This is this will be it. Yeah, what we, the, one of the things that's always important in formula cars that have splitters is there's a range where the splitter works and it doesn't work. So it, have you done any testing on this one to find out if you get it above a certain rear ride height, the splitter doesn't work anymore? Can you even tell? Um, I just haven't run it higher than 1.3. So I haven't tested anything drastic with ride height. I've just always been lowest in the front and 1.2, 1.3. 1.15 or so in the rear. All right. Well, if you have any more questions about these setups, just talk to me. Um, I'll be glad to tell you all my secrets why I was so fast at Lime Rock. Um, but a little tire hack. Um, just wanted to uh, say again, thank you guys for coming. We're going to have a, another class here in a few minutes. Uh, David Cater and Ray Alfala are going to show you how they set up cars. Uh, so it'd be an awesome time. Let's give Wyatt a big hand. Um, did, I, I wasn't in here for the whole presentation. Did you tell them about the services that you offer uh, for some online racers? No, I didn't. Um, and I'm doing that. You know, if you're interested in doing personal, private coaching stuff, uh, I do that all the time. And it'll be real uh, individual. You know, it's always private sessions. So um, you got my email address, my website. It's really easy to remember, wyattgooden.com. And some guys will actually get together with teams, four or five guys, and go into a session with you, and you work with guys and teams, so that makes yeah, it more affordable. Yeah, I do a bunch of team stuff. Um, sometimes I'll do weekly track guides and setups for teams and just group sessions with teams, four or five, ten people even. So, uh, you know, if you want to get a group together and do a session, uh, you'd really benefit from it. It'd be good. And uh, that way it gives me more of a chance to kind of work with you individually, which makes a huge difference, so I can actually – Focus on what your, you know, what your issues are, and we can really hone in on that. So.
That's great. Let's give Wyatt another hand. Thanks.